Hello everyone, this is Experiment Designs in Computer Science, Week 7, Sample Sizes, Part 1, Power Analysis. So, in this course, we talked many times about the necessity of collecting a sample, which is a set of multiple observations that are used to calculate the value of interest. A few people have asked how we calculate the sample size, and until now we have avoided talking about how big the sample should be. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we calculate the sample size and how the sample size affects our experiments or tests. So the topic of the lecture is what is the sample size, why do we need to worry about it, what factors influence the, fa the choice of sample size, and how we calculate the desired sample size. So as this will be a little bit of a re uh, reminder of lectures two and three, and as we discussed before, the result of an experiment is affected by several factors. Some of these factors are unknown or difficult to control. Because of these noise factors, sometimes there will be a small variance in the result of an repeated experiment. You do an experiment one time, two times, and the second time you do, the result is a little bit different from the first time you do the experiment. To measure, sorry, to measure this variance and take it into account for our analysis, we repeat the experiment several times, and we gather those repetitions into a sample. For example, if we throw three dice and add the values together, the true mean of this process is 10.5. Of course, every time we throw the dice, the results will be a little bit different. So that's noise because of physics, for example. So, if we want to estimate the true mean of a noisy process, like these three dice, we observe the process multiple times, we throw the dice multiple times, and we take the average of the sample values. We calculate the, mean, the sample mean, the sample average, which is an estimator of the true mean. That is a re reminder of lecture number two. Okay? As the sample gets larger, the sample error usually gets smaller. However, the noise of the original process does not change. So there is a point if your sample error, if your sample size is very, very big, you will still have only the influence of the noise of the process. So let's give here an example. We calculate a, uh, a sample of size two. So we throw three dice two times and we get the results. So I use this command to generate two dice. The first one was nine, the second one was six. Then I throw the dice five times, and then we have 10, 11, 9, 11, 12. And then I throw the dice 10 times. So we have 9, 12, 7, 9, 14, 11, 13, etc. Now, if we look at them, for the sample with size 2, the mean was 7.5, and we can see that it's much farther away than the true mean. The standard deviation was 2.2. For a sample of size 5, the mean was 10.6, and the standard deviation was 1.14. And for a sample of size 10, the mean was 10.7, and the standard deviation was 2.5. So we can see that when we move from sample size 2 to sample size 5, we got much closer to the true mean. But when we move to sample 10, we got a little bit farther away, which reflects that our process has a lot of noise. Okay, So increasing the sample size will reduce the noise, but will not eliminate the noise. That's why we need to do statistical tests, even if we have big sample sizes. So, why do we take samples? Larger sample sizes will help us isolate the error related to the noise of the process. This error has many influences in the analysis. This error will influence the size of the confidence interval, so when we increase the sample size, we get a smaller confidence interval, a more precise confidence interval. Also, the larger sample size will increase the confidence of the statistical tests. And a larger sample size will also increase the power of the statistical test. 
So because of all these positive values, we are interested in having a sample size that is big enough. Okay. Now, one thing that is an easy way to mistake is that because, oh, bigger sample size is good, we think, okay, the sample size should be as big as possible. Let's make the giants, let's take 1,000. Last year, I had one student that did an experimental, uh, an experimental analysis with 1 million samples. Uh, he had a simulation and he ran the simulation of dice 1 million times. Well, it's not always better to have these huge sample sizes. Okay? In general, we need a sample size that is big enough but there are some limitations. First, many experiments have a cost associated with a, a, which observation. If our observation, if our experiment is just to simulate three dice being rolled, then it's not very expensive. But if our experiment requires us to train a very expensive neural network, or our experiment requires us to take interviews with people, or our experiment requires us to make a meal, so the experiment has a cost, the cost can be in money or the cost can be in time. So there's a limit to how big of an experiment size we can make. Usually this, this, uh, this limit is in time. Uh, for instance, in my laboratory, many of the experiments uh, require simulation that take a lot of time. So the sample size is limited by how much time we, do, we have to do the experiment. <laughs> Some experiments require materials or conditions that are hard to obtain. So for example, if you have to do an experiment on Monday's mornings, then this experiment is limited and your sample size cannot be increased forever. Okay? So also, when we increase the sample size, it has diminishing returns in terms of confidence and power of tests. If you go from a sample size of two to a sample size of five, you get a big increase in uh, confidence. But if you go from sample size of five to 10, you also get an increase, but maybe not so big. If you go from sample size of 10 to 50, you get a different increase. If you go from a sample size of 1000 to 1050, the increase of confidence is not very big. So at some point, you increase the sample size, increases the cost of your experiment, but does not really increase the confidence. So we go back to the question, what is an appropriate sample size for an experiment? And we, it, it's good if we can make a calculation for that. So what is a good sample size for an experiment? So when you choose the sample size, you have to take three things in consideration. You can take other things, but at least you should think about these three things when you think about the sample size. The first, as I said in the last slide, is what is the cost of your experiment? What is a reasonable sample size in terms of expenses, in terms of time, in terms of complexity? The second thing that you have to think about is what is the confidence that you desire? What is the probability of type one error that is reasonable for your experiment? The third question is what is the power? beta. What is the probability of a type 2 error that is reasonable for your experiment? So when you have an idea of these three pieces of information that you have to de decide based on what is the question that you want to answer in your experiment, then you can use this information to calculate estimates of the sample size. Sometimes, of course, you don't have a choice. For example, if your experiment is very expensive, uh, then you don't really have a choice. You can only make five repetitions of your experiment and that's it. That's what you can make. And you don't have a choice of sample size. But even if you don't have a choice of your sample size, you still should do a sample size calculation. Because when you do a sample size calculation with a fixed sample size, it will tell you the, um, the confidence of your experiment and it will tell you the power of your experiment. And by looking at the confidence and then the power, maybe you can think, oh, okay, uh, my sample size is limited, but the confidence and the power are still okay. So I will do the experiment and then when I write the report, I will say, look, this was my result, 
But one limitation of my experiment is that because of cost, the power of my experiment is not very strong. Or on the other hand, you could, your calculation could tell that if you have a limited sample size, your experiment will have a very low power and that may motivate you to actually go to your advisor or go to your sponsor and say, look, I need more money to do this experiment because with the money that I have right now, the experiment will have very low power. Or maybe you can change something in your experiment to try to increase the power of your experiment. Well, to calculate the power of the experiment, the first thing that we need to do is to define the minimum interesting sample size, which we call delta star. And you may remember that we talked about the minimum interesting sample size before. So how do we calculate the uh, power of the experiment? Okay. Let's consider one example. Let's say that we have an experiment that is a one sample. So we are comparing one sample against a fixed value. And the experiment has the following parameters. The alternate hypothesis is one-sided. So we are testing if, our, if the mean of our sample is above a certain value or below a certain value. The sample size is fixed at 10. Or difference of interest is 0 0.5. So we want to detect a difference of at least 0 0.5 between the established value and the mean of the sample. The standard deviation was estimated to be sigma equal to 1. And the significance that we desire is alpha equal to 0 0.01. And now we ask, what is the power of this experiment? Notice here that we don't even need to do the experiment to, do, to calculate the power. We can calculate the power of the experiment before we execute the experiment. The only thing that we need to know is the sample size or hypothesis type, the variation in value that we are interested, the estimation of the standard deviation, and this may be something that we need to do a little bit of study to find out, and the our target significance. Now, if we calculate this, and we calculate this for in R, for example, with the power of the test, so we put here N10, SD1, etc., etc., and it will give us this information. So it gives us all the information that it put and the power that we did not include the power it will calculate. And we can see here that for these parameters the power of our experiment is 0 0.16. So this is very very low. This means that we have our beta here is 0 0.84. So we have 0 0.84 chance to have a false negative. Okay, so there's a very high chance with these parameters for our experiment result in a false negative, in failure to, the, to reject the new hypothesis, even though the new hypothesis should have been rejected. So what can we do when the experiment has low power? Well, one thing that we could do, there are several things that we can make, but one thing that we could do is that we could increase the number of observations. So if we have a little bit more budget, instead of 10 observations, we could do 20 or 30 observations maybe. And we're going to talk about this later. But another thing that we could do is that we could increase the size of the minimal difference. OK, so this is OK. Um, let's say that I will I'm only concerned about differences of two or five or 10. OK. So we can use the same formula that we did before. And let's say that we are interested in having a power of 0 0.8, a beta of 0 0.2. So what is the difference that we can observe with a power of 0 0.8? So we redo the calculation. And now, instead of defining the delta, we define the power. So we are targeting a power of 0 0.8. And when we do the power calculation with these parameters, we can see that now it gives us a delta of 1.1. So this means that with these parameters, uh, significance le level of 0 0.01, power of 0 0.8, the amount of difference that we can detect in this experiment is 1.1. So our experiment is not powerful enough to detect a difference of 0 0.5, but it's powerful enough to detect a difference of 1.2. So now the question changes. Our question becomes, 
Okay, so we have an experiment that may not detect differences below 1.2. Is this okay? So we have to talk to to think about it. Is is it okay? Is it significant for us to um, detect differences that are only 1.2 or bigger? This, of course, will depend on the experiment. Okay, this is not an answer that has a calculation. This is an answer that depends on what is the scientific question that you are trying to answer. For example, if you are trying to detect a difference of one second in the loading time of a web page, well, that seems to be a pretty big difference. Uh, but a difference of half a second would also be a big difference, especially if this is done millions and millions of times. On the other hand, if you are calculating, a if you are trying to detect a difference of 1%, in the precision of a um, of, of, a, of an image classifier, well, a difference of 0.5% is not very big. So I don't care so much that I cannot detect 0.5%. If I can detect a difference of at least 1%, then I'm happy. And this experiment tells me that I can detect a difference of at least 1.2%. So I guess I'm happy with this experiment, okay? So it really depends on your field of research. So some considerations, some final considerations about the power calculation. Using power calculations, we obtain an estimate of the probability of type 2 error. This gives us a better understanding of what the experiment can do and what the experiment cannot do. This is important when we decide if we want to do the experiment like that or if you want to change uh, the design of an experiment and how we report the experiment when we publish a paper or when we write a report. We can tell, oh, this is the power of our experiment. This is the confidence of our experiment. The statistical test will still have power for differences smaller than delta, but it will be a smaller power, okay? These differences are below the minimally interesting effect. On the other hand, any effect that is bigger than delta will have an even higher power. So it's even easier to detect the bigger the, 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 the effect is. Okay? And we can use this power calculation to compute the required sample size. So we're going to see that in the next video. So see you in the next video to talk more about sample size calculation. Bye-bye.